knowing our God is omnipresent. He is everywhere. Therefore, when we look at the Godhead, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, for the good of man and in the creation of man. You see, design demands a designer. Life demands a life giver. Creation demands a creator. If there is order, it demands an authority in that order. Things do not go from disorder to order. They go from order to disorder. If we walked out of this building this evening, this beautiful building, locked the doors and all walked out, and came back 20 years later, this building would not have repainted itself and remade itself and recreated itself. This building would have fallen apart. The carpet would be rolled up on the floor. The pews, the cushions would have exploded. The, the innards of the cushions would be out. The paint would roll off the wall because things do not go from disorder to order. They go from order to disorder. Therefore, when we go to the Bible, we go to the book of Genesis chapter 1 and verses 1. Those who claim that they have found Eureka, we have found that there are only five categories in life. They say there is time, that there is force, that there is action, that there is space, and there is matter. And I remember in physics class, as the teacher with prefixes and suffixes on his name, began to tell us about these, this great discovery. In my mind, I, I didn't say anything because I wanted a grade that was worthy, so I kept my mouth shut, but I wanted to tell him all you got to do is listen to Moses. Because in the very first verse of the Bible, Moses tells us that these are the five categories of existence. He says, in the beginning, that is time, God, that is force, created, that is action, the heavens, that is space, the earth, that is matter. It's all right there in the very first verse of the Bible. Did it accidentally get there? It is there because God placed it there in 2023 when there are folks what they should God wants us to know that there is nothing that man knows that God doesn't already know. There is nothing we discover that God has not already created. The relevance of this as we follow Jeff's masterful sermon on marriage and all of us, no matter how long you've been marriage, married, could learn something from that lesson. I was married for almost 45 years to a beautiful woman that I had met at Fried Hardeman University back in 1970 and married her in 1972. And she was my wife for almost 45 years. I lost her in September of 15. But one of the things that I learned and understand and understood even to this day is how blessed we are when God brings us together with someone who understands our soul Someone that can finish your sentences. Someone that you can glance over at while you're preaching and you know you shouldn't have said that. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about, don't you? And I had that blessing for many, many years. Why is that? We go back to our creator. The Bible says in the beginning, God. God created. God the Father who plans all. God the Son who executes all. God the Holy Spirit who brings order out of chaos. God decided to create. God created this earth, hung the sun on nothing, placed the moon in its place, flung the stars out into the sky. God who had made this universe, brought it into order by the sun, as Paul said to the brethren at Colossae, that Jesus brought everything into existence. The Holy Spirit's job is to beautify, to bring order out of chaos. God said, let there be light. The Spirit brought it. God said, get that water in one place. The Spirit got it in one place. Put some grass on that stuff. Spirit got it, the grass there. In essence, each of them, the three members of the Godhead, 
of these, this, th this three uh, divine personalities work together for creation, and they work together for the benefit of mankind. After God had put beast in the water, beast in the air, beast, four-footed beast on the earth, beast that crawled upon the earth, beast that roared and cawed and cried, God had created all of those beasts, and God made a quality assessment of his earth. God says, it's good. Yea, it's very good. Then God made a statement. Now, now that we have this environment, now that we have planted this garden, now that there are so many beautiful things to enjoy, now let us make man in our own image, after our likeness. And the Bible tells me God, like an artisan, formed man from the dust of the earth. He wet the dust and he molded the dust and made that mud man, formed man from the dust of the earth, breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. Not a living creature. He'd already created living creatures. Man has a duality. He's different from the lions, tigers, and bears, oh my. He is different from all of them. God breathed upon him. He said, let us make man in our image and after our likeness. And that's as man is to reflect God. The beasts of the field, while God created them, and God gave them life, God gave them instinctive motivation. That instinctive motivation means that they act within their nature. The cow moves because that's its nature. The cat meows because that's its nature. The dog barks because that's his nature. The cow can't say, I've been speaking cow my whole life. I'm going to learn how to speak dog because they have to act within their nature. But God gave you something else. God gave you intellect, gave you reasoning. God gave you a different type, a higher intelligence than God gave you law. God gave you instructions, and then God gave you free agency. God gave you the ability not to act like a creature that can't violate his nature, but God gave you the intelligence and the choice so that you can decide who and what you're going to be. This is why the Bible is written in comparative language. The Bible is written where God gives you the blessings, God gives you the curses, and God said, make your choices. Make your choices. I'm a good God. I'm a wonderful Father. I am a caring and forgiving and long-suffering God. You make your choice as to who you want to follow. I tell people there are two people inviting you. Jesus says, come to me, all of you that labor and are heavy laden, I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn. Be instructed because I gave you intelligence and reason. Learn of me because I am meek and lowly in heart and you will find rest to your soul. Jesus says, I'm inviting you. And he gave you that word in that book, in comparative language, he gives the curses. He placed them there in comparative language within that book so that you, who are not just a beast of the field, a creature of the forest, but made in his image and in his likeness to reflect, to reflect who God is, God says, now you choose who you're going to follow. Two inviters, Jesus invites you, but there's someone else that invites you. As I told you in my last lesson, Paul Peter said, be sober. He's inviting. Be vigilant. He's, he offers pleasure because your adversary, the one who's trying to keep you out of heaven because he can't go there. How do you be such a fool you get kicked out of heaven? And he got kicked out of heaven, don't want you to go because you can have something that he cannot have. So he's inviting you. God told each of you 
that hell was not made for you. Hell was made for the devil and his angels. The only way you can even get in hell is to accept the invitation of the current occupant. And we should not accept this invitation. Therefore, God has made all. God said, now let us make man in our image and after our likeness, form them from the dust of the earth. Breathe into his nostrils the breath of life. Man became a living soul. God placed him in the garden. Everything pleasant to the taste was in the garden. Pleasant to the eye was in the garden. Pleasant sounds to the ear was in the garden. Pleasant to the touch was in the garden. Everything pleasant to see and to taste and to touch and experience is in that garden. But still, when God made a quality assessment of man, Man's existence within paradise itself, God said one thing that he didn't pass as perfect. He said, it is not good that man should be alone. And that word man is not a near meaning the male, but it is the word meaning mankind is a social being. Mankind needs someone. Paul said, no man live it to himself, no man die it to himself. We need someone else. God created man to be a being that has an outreach to love someone and also the need for someone to love him back. So therefore God said, to man, God placed Adam right there, and in, in the Bible says God, under the guise of letting him name the creatures, if God can make the creatures, God can name the creatures. But God said, let me parade all this stuff in front of you, boy. See anything you like? No, no, ooh, no, no, not that. Mm -mm. See anything you want to mate with? No, Lord, I don't see nothing I want to mate with. God said for everything there was a mate. Didn't he say it? But for man, there was not a mate. Therefore, the Bible lets me know that God put Adam in a deep sleep. While he was in that sleep, God opened his side. From his side, he removed the rib. With that rib, he made the woman. Build it from the Hebrew. Build it the woman placed her at his side that he became, she became neither his master nor his slave, but another self brought alongside the man to be his counselor and to be his helpmate. Therefore, God had made something wonderful. The crown jewel of his creation, God created the woman. Adam was wakened from his sleep. Can you see the excitement of this man? We're all men in this room. And you got someone made by God personally with everything beautiful for Adam to look upon this other human being for the first time. In the Hebrew, the Bible says it's been translated. Adam said, now she. But that really, if you really want to put it, Adam said, wow. Wow. That's what Adam said. She, now she is bones of my bones. This Eve, God gave him the privilege of telling us, even in 2023, how God wants the family to be set up and the foundation of society as God sees it is the family, beginning with the husband and the wife as he created it. Therefore, when God placed them in that garden, he gave them both. Adam is the federal head in that he was created first. But the man and the woman are for all intents and purposes equal. God gave them both the prohibition, saying, of every tree in this garden you may eat, but the one tree, and God says, you know what? I'm going to put it in the middle so you can't say, well, God, I didn't know which tree you were talking about. God said, I'm going to put the tree in the middle of the garden. I'm putting it in the middle. And if you eat of that tree, God says you will die. You shall surely die. But you got to remember something. There was rebellion in heaven. And the devil brought his 
old ugly lion self into the garden and brought the feud that began in heaven. He brought the feud down to man. He brought the feud into Adam's house with Adam's wife, told the first and most diabolical lie that has ever been told, you shall not surely die. Eve believed the lie, being seduced, being deceived, and being pulled away from both her husband's law and God's law. And she took up the tree. Adam standing there. You know, folks think Adam was out fishing somewhere. No, he was not. The Bible lets me know Adam was in close proximity, but Adam was so mesmerized by the presence of his wife that he lost focus as to who God was and he took of the tree full knowing that he was committing suicide by God in order to die with his wife. Now, of course, it makes the allegory work that the first Adam stepped down to die with his bride. The second Adam stepped down to die with his bride also. While it makes the allegory work, it made God mad. Because first of all, God punished the beast. He let the beast know, I'm taking you, I'm bumping you down. You were not, weak. that's another time and another argument, another discussion as to who the beast was. But God moved him out of the way and let him know that through the woman you brought man down, through the woman I'm going to bring man back up again. Then he turned to Eve. He said, Eve, Eve, what have you done? Eve, do you understand what it's going to take? For me to fix what you have done? God is not asking for information. He's asking for confirmation. And Eve says that I was seduced. I was beguiled. And God says, you know what? I'm changing things. I'm changing the rules of society right here and right now in this garden. As they can. And that's true. That's why it's called punishment. It's called punishment. Because you can do those things. God never said the woman was ignorant or unequal. But he said, because you refuse to obey someone greater than you and be subordinate to someone greater than you, now I will make you be subordinate to someone equal to you if you're going to be in my favor and come live in my heaven. The devil brought that feud to earth. And the Lord let him know, I'm going to bash your head. I'm going to send somebody. You're going to bruise his heel, but I'm going to bash your head. And we're going to straighten out what happened here. I want you to realize that God on that day, after he had told man, by the sweat of your brow, you're going to have to work. You're going to have to have a work ethic. You're going to have to suffer. You're going to have to strive. But I'm a good God, a merciful God, a benevolent God. Still, Job said that man born of a woman is of a few days and full of trouble. God never told you that you wouldn't have trouble. God never told you that you wouldn't have tears and have to fight for everything you get. What God says, I'm a fair God. I'm a loving God. And I'm a long-suffering God. So what does this have to do with being parents? When I understand that children belong to God, they don't belong to me. They belong to God. And that we are stewards of God's heritage. We are stewards of what belongs to God. We already messed up in Eden. We're trying to go to heaven. We're trying to maintain our society. We're trying to send those into the future who are ready for the future. And for this reason, you and I as fathers in this room, all of us with your wives as parents, each of us have to understand the responsibility that God has given us. You can all quote the scriptures. I'm not going to quote any scripture that you haven't heard before. But what I want to do is have a call to action of the men that are in this room. We hear it all the time. 
Folks talk about the lost generation, the lost generation, the lost generation. Everybody talks about the lost generation, but nobody wants to talk about who lost them and how they were lost. What lost them? What sent them in the wrong direction? What misguided them? Who mistaught them? Who failed to show authority in front of them? Who didn't influence them? Who didn't hold them accountable? Who refused to call them to responsibility for their actions? This is where we have to take an introspective examination of ourselves as we look across this society. God created the family. God created mothers. God created fathers. And God gave us our responsibilities. Children are not young adults. Children are children. If they could raise themselves, God wouldn't have given them parents. God gave them parents because they couldn't raise themselves. I remember one time, Jeff, <clears throat> my dad had me in his office. I had done something. I don't remember what it was, but it was enough for me to call him to call me in his office, close the door from my sisters and brothers and my mama, and him and me have a man-to-man, eyeball-to-eyeball talk. This was one of those times when you probably weren't going to get a whipping, but you wish you had when he got through talking to you. And my dad, he looked at me with such disgust and disappointment when I was talking. I was going on and on. And dad had said, Nick, you tell him one of those round lies, aren't you? I said, what do you mean? He said, you don't know where that lie starts. You don't know where that lie ends. He said, that's a, that's a round lie. And I can remember that day just like it was yesterday because it was a day that my father called me to account to be a man, to stand up, to admit when I'm wrong, to take responsibility when I do things that are not scriptural, that are not spiritual, and when I violate his law. I never heard, not once, brethren, I was never asked if I felt like going to school. I was never asked if I wanted to go to church. I don't remember being asked if you have time for vacation Bible school. I don't remember being asked, uh, can you fit Sunday school into your schedule today? I don't ever being asked, what about midweek Bible class? Uh, uh, you got anything going on uh, that you could kind of shuffle to the side so we can go to church tonight? I just don't remember being asked any of that. And we each have got to ask ourselves, why in the world have we given up the authority that God gave you to your children, to our children that we have lost? I had people used to come to me and say, Brother D. Barry, you, your daughter's at church too much. Uh, they don't need all that church. And, uh, they don't need to be at everything. I said, let me tell you something. I, I felt like saying, get out of my face. But I'm, you know, <laughs> that, that, that South Memphis almost came out of me. <laughs> but, but I held it in, Jeff. I, I said, let me tell you something. I am raising my grandchildren's mama. That's what I'm doing. I'm raising my grandchildren's mama. And I may not get to see them grow up, but I guarantee you they're going to hear my voice, they're going to hear my wife's voice, and they're going to know what's right because I'm going to put it in them what's right. Too many of us have forgotten the simple things that every man in this room can quote. Proverbs chapter 21 and verses 6. Y'all can quote it with me. Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he won't depart from it. We already know this. If we know it, why don't we practice it? Why don't we implement it? Why don't we enforce it? Right now, I'm, I am 72 years old. I think I'm 72. <laughs> <laughs> I was born in 51, so I think that makes me 72. How? Yeah. <laughs> I, my mama used to tell me I would come home from basketball or football or whatever, and I would go to her table. She would say, Nick, get up from my table. 
Ma'am, get up from my table and put a shirt on. You can't come to my, my table in a, without a shirt or with a T-shirt. Go put a shirt on. And I would have to go put a shirt on because the food was good. And I had to put a shirt on <laughs> to come back to the table. And I used to tell my wife, used to laugh at me. She used to laugh at me. I'd come to the table. This is my house. My mama been gone since 1972. I'm this is my house. I pay the rent at 1207. I keep the lights on. I'm going to eat in my T-shirt. I sit down at my table. I hear mama's voice, Nick. You go put a shirt on. And I had to, she'll sit there and she just laugh at me. She called you again, didn't she? I have to go put my shirt on because that teaching that she gave me, it wasn't about the t-shirt. It was about respect for her. It was about respect for her memory. It was about respect for what I had that God gave me when he gave me a godly mama and a godly father. It was respect for the things they instilled in me as a child. And when I look at myself and I look at my own children, I have to ask myself, am I respecting their memory and their legacy and their heritage and what they taught me? And I tried to teach the same things to my children so that my children one day will tell stories about what daddy had said to them. When, 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 when Solomon said in Proverbs 22 and verses six, when he said, train up a child, that train up from the Hebrew means force him up, force him up. You know what I'm saying, do you, you feel like uh, cutting the grass? You feel like washing the dishes? You, you, you feel like making your bed today. <laughs> but Solomon said, force him up. Force him up. That word train comes from a Hebrew word, which means you force that child to be what he ought to be. You're the one with the superior knowledge. You're the person who know where the ditches in life are. You know, if a, I've had, had children tell their parents, well, you made mistakes. Well, absolutely I did. That's why I'm trying to help you. Benjamin Franklin said, experience holds a bitter school, but the fool will learn in no other. You can learn by being taught, or you can learn by trying to crawl out of the ditch. You can, be, you can learn by being shown where the traps are, or you can learn by trying to work your way out of the trap. You can learn by being pointed out where the liars are, or you can learn by trying to recover from being lied to. That's where parents come in. Train up, force up a child in the way he should go. It's the same in the Greek. In the book of Ephesians chapter six and verses four, Paul said, and you fathers, provoke not your children to wrath. Be good fathers, be good fathers, be good fathers. You don't have to be rough all the time. Know how to use the firm hand, but also know how to use the tender touch. Know when to let, like my daddy did me one time, I'm telling you, I came home from football practice I think it was a Wednesday and I had to go to church and you know, but my mother said, you start smelling yourself. I don't know what that means, but she used to say it all the time. I came in my mama's house, clip clock, clip clock, got my cleats on. My mama said, Nick, don't walk on my hardwood floors with those cleats, clip clock. I'm coming in the house, go to my room, slam the door. Laying on my bed with my cleats on, on the bed. Pretty soon, <laughs> I saw the doorknob turning. <laughs> my daddy walked in, start, took his jacket off, put it on the hanger. My eyes getting big as a half dollar. <laughs> Hung the coat up in the closet, said, uh, unbutton the shirt, say, heard you been talking bad to my woman. It's his woman, ain't my mama no more. <laughs> so You've been talking bad to my woman. I said, no, sir. 
I was getting young about a minute. He said, no, no, I heard you were talking bad to my woman. And, you know, before my dad had left out of there, I was almost back in diapers, I'm telling you. <laughs> what he let me know in no uncertain terms on that day, that I didn't run nothing in his house. And that if I was in his house, that I was going to obey his rules. So we got too many of us who too nice and we're going to nice our children all the way to torment, as Madea used to say. There comes a time when you have to be the man in the house. All the d children had drug issues. We all had drug issues. We would drug the Bible class. We would drug the Sunday night service. We would drug to vacation Bible school. We would drug to gospel meetings. We would drug all over the place where somebody was having church. And you know what happened? I learned to like it. I learned to like it. I learned to appreciate it. When you hear sermons like what Jeff just preached already, what TJ preached earlier, when you hear those sermons, if you have an open mind and a receptive heart, God said, receive with meekness the engrafted. You start changing. You start changing. I love, I, I wanted somewhere around fifth, sixth grade, I asked my daddy, can I start leading songs? I started leading songs. Somewhere around seventh or eighth grade, I said, can I start preaching? He said, not yet. Folks will say it's cute. And he wouldn't let me start preaching until about 10th grade. But the issue I want you to take to heart is this. The word of God changed us, it built us, it strengthened us, it enlightened us, it raised us, it made us men and women who are Christians. My younger brother is in the pulpit every Sunday morning at North Germantown Church of Christ in Memphis. My middle brother is in the pulpit every Sunday at the University Church of Christ in Charlotte, North Carolina. My brother-in-law who married my little sister is in the pulpit every Sunday at the Horn Lake and Levi Church of Christ. Our family is what it is. Took charge of it. Told us what we were going to do and what we were not going to do. Someone said one time, well, Brother DeBerry, your daughters are uppity. I said, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Telling me they're uppity. I raised them to be uppity. I want them to be uppity. In other words, I don't, you got to bring your A game to get my daughters. Don't come talking about no Big Mac and a Coke. <laughs> You're going to get my daughters. Say, and fathers, don't be the first person to give your daughters flowers. Don't be the first person to take your daughters out for a nice dinner. I mean, don't, be, don't let someone else be the first person, excuse me. Don't let someone else be the first person to give them flowers, to take them to a nice dinner, to give them a nice piece of jewelry. You are their first uh, um, understanding of what a man ought to be. You are their first understanding. My daughter, one time, my, my, my eldest daughter, before she got married, and, and she was looking at a few knuckleheads out there, test, testing them out. And I was trying to tell her, I said, Shavita, don't do this. And Shavita, don't do it. How am I doing on time? Oh, okay. Shavita, how you, how, don't,